Coming to you from Grand Rounds Brewing Company and Restaurant, Our Town. I won't forget to find them, because I've got memories and travel like gypsies in the night. Author Amy Hahn is here today to talk about her new book, Lost Rochester, Minnesota. Welcome to Our Town. Thank you. <laughs> that is such an intriguing title, Lost Rochester. <laughs> what are some of the most interesting lost places that you discovered when writing this book? Well, it's really hard to just pick one. <laughs> but um, one of the most interesting was the Horse Thief Cave. Okay. And the Horse Thief Cave, there could have been more than one, but um, there, there's this whole area is built above caves. There's all kinds of underground cave, caverns and, and waterways. And so there's a legend that kind of started about horse, horse thieves hiding their horses in the cave to get away from authorities. And the truth is there were anti-horse thievery societies in this area. Area okay. because horse thievery did happen in the 1860s, 1870s, because horses were a hot commodity. Sure. You know, no one had cars, so that's what plowed your fields and that's what drove your buggy. Mm -hmm. So it kind of started that there was these horse thief caves around the area where they would hide out. Now, granted, I never really found evidence that that really happened, <laughs> but there is evidence that there's caves and there were farmers that used the caves to store their livestock in wow. and their crops. And the animals would fall in the cave sometimes uh, because the, it would get so saturated and then they would fall in, they'd discover another cave. And the state hospital too, which was on the southeast part of, of town, okay. they also had caves and they also stored you know, some of their food and other items in there. That's great. And so other than this horse, uh, the Horse Thieves Caves, do you have also the Bradley, it's the Bradley House? The Bradley House, okay. yes. Oh, what, what was that? Where is that? And or yeah. what was that, I guess? And, and what was that about? Yeah, well, the Bradley House was a stop on the Dubuque Trail, which was the mail route and stagecoach route that came through Rochester. So it operated for a good decade from the 1860s to the 1870s when the railroad came through. Mm -hmm. And the Bradley House was kind of near 3rd Avenue Southeast and 4th Street. Mm -hmm. And that the 3rd Avenue Southeast is actually was called Dubuque Street at the time because of the Dubuque Trail. And that was the trail or stagecoach route from Dubuque Iowa to St. Paul. So it was a very popular spot for overnight guests to stay on their route up to the cities. And sometimes they would stay here just in Rochester. Sure. So much of Rochester right now is, is, is defined by the Mayo Clinic. Yes. And so, I mean, this book is about, pre, predates you know, the Mayo Clinic in so many different ways. So tell us a little bit more about the Rochester before the Mayo Clinic. Paint us a picture of what that <laughs> must have looked like. I mean, can we imagine it? I know, it's kind of hard to do, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, Mayo Clinic is, you know, of course, so important to the city. And it really, of course, was a main element to its growth and development. But people came here, immigrants traveled here to buy land and to build, they wanted to homestead and have farms and they came from New England was where the main immigrants came from and their whole purpose was farming this is a very rich cultural area and before Rochester became known as the Med City it really was the wheat basket of Minnesota and they grew wheat mainly and there was a whole area down here Filmer County Olmsted right. County mm -hmm. all of that so they had grist mills you know once they got their farms you know the houses built, then they get grist mills, they had mm -hmm. started stores, they wanted education, so they started schools. So it was really an agricultural area, and that's what pulled people here. Well, you seem like a fount of knowledge about the history <laughs> here. Uh, what was the research process like for this book? Well, yeah, it was pretty um, intense. I only had about seven months to do it all. Yeah, and so I was a little intimidated because I had to not only find all the photos and then find all the material and all the information, I had to write it as well in the formatting and guidelines that the publisher wanted and submit it. So I spent a lot of time at the History Center of Olmsted County, which is a treasure trove of information for this area. And I was there many days, many hours, digging through things and also looking through, you know, following trails. And I went through a lot of microfilm too for old oh, newspapers wow. to find descriptions of the buildings, of the people. Good old bitch obituaries are very descriptive. So it was, you know, a very challenging, but it was really fun to do. I really enjoyed it. And as, as Rochester changes, I'm sure there's so, so many conversations about historical preservation, yes. things like that. What did you learn, or did you learn anything about um, why some of the um, landmarks were removed, or why we, don't, we no longer have some of these lost places anymore? Well, a lot of times, especially in the early days, um, Rochester at fires really destroyed a lot of the buildings because they were built close together and fires jumped from one building to another. So that happened. A lot of times if they were vacated because a business closed and another business didn't go in there, then if the, a building is vacated, 
vacated too long, it deteriorates very quickly, mm -hmm. and so eventually it gets to a point where you can't save it, so it gets torn down and a new building is built. But another, an interesting d d uh, building that was demolished was the 1898 uh, Fire Hall, mm -hmm. which sat on the Broadway, and it was on the south edge of Broadway, which was really the edge of town at the time. And what happened to that building, it wasn't very old, it was only like 30 some years old, is that uh, the Broadway became U.S. Highway 63. And so they needed to get rid of it so that they could have a very thorough way for the traffic. And so it sat right in the middle. So they, <laughs> they, they, got, to get rid of yeah, they got rid of, of it. Yeah. And are you or anyone, anyone else you know tracking some of the changes that are happening because of Destination Medical Center? So historical places that are maybe being torn down or sort of being... You know, discuss. discuss yeah. yeah, a lot of, I like the historic preservation, there's a committee, a heritage preservation committee here that is with the city and the mayor appoints the 11 members and then the, um, he nominates them actually and then the city council appoints them. And they kind of take a look at all that, so they're, they're very active in that. There's also a lot of local citizens that are very passionate and they kind of do grassroots type things to kind of get the word out and educate people about the buildings that are left. And then of course most of the historic buildings are in the downtown area because that was the main beginnings of Rochester. So it is a balancing act too on how how do you preserve and then also move forward with your, you know, economic growth. So well, before we end here, your book is supposed to be out on November 27th. Yes. How can people get their hands on it? Yeah, well, it will be available at Barnes & Noble, at Apache Mall. It will be available at the History Center of Olmsted County. And, of course, there's the online as well. And um, there's an upcoming event at the History Center of Olmsted County on November 30th from 5 to 7. It's kind of a book launch event. And we're going to have, you know, book signings, some books for sale, some light refreshments. And then there will be a December 16th book signing at Barnes & Noble from 1 to 3. Well, so. thank you so much, and congratulations <laughs> on your new book. Thank you. is brought to you in part by the following amazing people and organizations. The new Clements Subaru proudly partners with award-winning KSMQ Public Television. Clements Subaru of Rochester. Clements Clear Value Promise is to make buying a Subaru fast, fair, and simple. The Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. And the members of KSMQ Public Television. Thank you. Hey, stay with us. Uh, more Our Town ahead. Danielle Teal and friends are doling out hugs and flowers to promote random acts of kindness. Also, we take a look back at the many incarnations of the Miracle Mile Shopping Center and Mayo Clinic Ventures is collaborating with Minnesota private colleges in science and economics. Jim Rogers tells us all about it. Up first though, we hear from a Rochester couple about their Vietnam War experiences in this week's Our Culture segment. My dad always said that the army ran on young men. And that's true. Most of the, most of the people in basic are uh, 18 to 20. I was 25 and a half when I got drafted. I went in, uh, trained as a generator mechanic, and uh, eventually uh, I went. I became motor sergeant because they couldn't get enough motor sergeants that didn't last very long. <laughs> and then I was shipped to Vietnam. Uh, Dao Tiang and uh, Ku Chi. I graduated in June of 69 and I immediately went to Minneapolis and started school. And so I was thrust into, um, you know, a large city coming from Spring Valley where I was raised and graduated from. And so that was a big wake up call as far as what was going on. And I was going to school and I worked at Dayton's department store downtown on Necklet Mall, the original Dayton's. And uh, that's where the protests were, was downtown Necklet Mall. And 
we had an hour lunch and so that's when they organized it so i put my black armband on and i and i marched and then the surprise was because i was just a little country bumpkin and not really you know aware of of what the repercussions might be so when that started then there were people from dayton who met you at the door as you came back to work and said you take the armband off or you know you don't have a job so I marched against it during the time that Pat was in Vietnam. The thing that I did have problems with is that a lot of people were criticizing the soldiers. And I made it very clear to my friends and the people I marched with and so forth that I was against the war. I was not against the individual soldiers. And there were kids from my high school that were drafted. There were a couple who volunteered. You know, when we came home, there was all the hellabaloo about uh, the baby killers and things. I didn't get into much of that, a little bit in the airport when I touched in California. But when I came back here, that wasn't the case. But at any rate, today I wear my cap very proudly. Uh, I was there. Oh, the, the reactions of people have been very good. They'll come up and thank me quite often. And uh, thank you for your service. And uh, the first time that happened, it, it startled me. You know, I, I wasn't ready for it. There's, there's a lot different attitude now than, well, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, I think it was. Uh, and it's, it's a, much more appreciated. People are starting to realize that, uh, to use a cliche, freedom isn't free. For more information about this story and other Our Town features, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter at KSMQ hashtag Our Town or KSMQ.org slash Our Town. While the weather has been a little erratic lately, winter is on its way. One prominent Minnesota meteorologist has suggested we're in for a cold and snowy winter. Rochester Public Works has published their guidelines for sidewalk shoveling. A Rochester City Ordinance requires property owners with a public sidewalk or path abutting their property to fully remove the snow and ice within 24 hours after a snowfall. The city does provide a free salt and sand mixture at two locations in town to help with that job. To find out more, full details are at rochestermn.gov. And if you're ready to get into the holiday season, Rochester has no shortage of choices. The Rochester Repertory Theater is presenting every Christmas story ever told, and then some beginning November 24th. It's a madcap comedy that explores the many tales that accompany this festive season. Tickets and information at rochesterrep.org. And the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on Viola Heights Drive, Northeast, is holding their annual The Wonder of the Nativity display, including more than 200 nativity scenes, live music, a live nativity, and refreshments. Check it out on Friday, December 1st from 5 to 9 p.m. and Saturday, December 2nd, from 2 to 8.30 p.m. For a map and all the details, visit rochesternativities.org. The Rochester Pops Orchestra Winter Wonderland Concert will be Sunday, December 17th, 7.30 p.m. at Bethel Lutheran Church. Christmas standards as well as pieces from the movies Home Alone, The Polar Express, and White Christmas will be featured. The orchestra will be accompanied by the newly formed Rochester Pops Chorale. More information at rochesterpops.com. And while not technically a Christmas event, the Feast, local marketplace, has been a December favorite. Farmers and food makers showcase and sell their products at the Mayo Civic Center on Saturday, December 2nd. Chef demonstrations, DIY projects, and local beer and wine tasting. Sounds pretty festive to me. Check out local-feast.org. And coming up next, Danielle Teal is spreading holiday cheer in this week's Walkabout segment. Danielle Teal with Our Town Walkabout, and we're celebrating Minnesota Kindness Week. What are you doing right now? 
Uh, we're giving away free flowers and hugs for Minnesota Acts of Kindness. I feel pretty great walking around with all these flowers. Can't wait to give them all out. Were people staring at you, wondering like what's going on? If they were, I gave them a flower. I started a movement called the I Hug Movement. I want people to wear the pins and it's an opening, it's a welcoming for people to come in for a hug. It's also a warning to other people that I'm going to hug them. We are here for Minnesota Acts of Kindness and we're just spreading love everywhere, giving hugs and flowers to people that uh, we see anywhere that we're going today. We're going outside in this very frigid weather, but we're going to really heat it up out there with hugs and flowers and chocolate. What has been your favorite random act of kindness this week? Probably giving the parking attendant the garage that I park at a cup of coffee. Why do you think acts of kindness is so important? I think that there's so much negativity uh, in our world that we see that's publicized that we really need to focus on the positivity. It is so freezing outside, but so worth it. So people are going to be so happy when they get a uh, flower and hopefully they'll accept a hug as well. <laughs> Thank you. you. My ears are numb and my nose is numb. You want to feel? <laughs> okay, let's feel. I'm going to feel. Okay, we're going to give you another flower for oh that. Oh my goodness! And do you mind if I give you a hug? I love a let's hug! Let's do it. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I'm jealous. Everybody, oh, you're jealous. jealous! Oh, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> hug! 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 Woo! You give really good hugs. I practice a lot. Jim Rogers from Mayo Clinic Ventures is right here on Our Town. He's talking about a thriving partnership with Minnesota grad students. Stay with us for that. Our past, remembering what made us who we are today. Brought to you by the History Center of Olmsted County. Miracle Mile, the first shopping center built outside the Twin Cities, opened in the fall of 1952 with seven stores, including a Red Owl grocery store. The outdoor mall was an immediate hit. Snyder Drug, Donaldson's department store, and Niesner's, which had a 100-foot soda fountain, joined them in 1953. Competition from Crossroads, built in 1962, and Apache Mall, built in 1969, and the removal of direct access to US Highway 52 affected Miracle Mile's customer base, and it began to struggle. In February 1971, a vicious fire wiped out the south end of the mall closing 26 businesses and causing $1.5 million in damage. It remains the city's most costly fire. A 1979 expansion project hoped to revitalize the mall, adding 10,000 square feet. A $2 million facelift was finished in 2007. Currently, Miracle Mile is once again undergoing a makeover with a $35 million apartment and retail project under construction on the mall's south end. Welcome back to Grand Rounds. In its 11th year, the Mayo Innovation Scholars Program has really become a win-win for Mayo Clinic Ventures and Minnesota students. Here to tell us more is Jim Rogers, Chair of Mayo Clinic Ventures. Welcome to our town. Thank you. So Mayo Clinic Ventures, can you tell us a little bit about what that program is? Sure. So Mayo Clinic Ventures is the group that's responsible with a Mayo Clinic to take all the good ideas that are being generated within Mayo funded by the research efforts and ideas that clinicians are coming up with and allied health staff, everybody, and try to commercialize those, uh, those inventions and ideas for the benefit of the healthcare system and for patients. Revenue that's generated then goes back to Mayo Clinic to continue to feed Mayo Clinic's clinical practice and its research and education programs. So the, the part about students is just a very small portion of what you do? It, it is. And, and when you see Mayo's logo, you have the three shields. You have the clinical, the education, the research. To us, this is our education piece of how we support the education mission at Mayo Clinic. So talk about how all of your folks with tech, all of your expertise, and you know, world class, how do you interact with college students? I know they're grad students, but still yep. there's a gap there. What do you, yep. what do, you do? I, you know, students bring unbelievable energy and unbelievable ideas to the table. And the program really essentially allows them to interact with our physicians and our researchers and take a look at the ideas that they're generating 
and try to build a business plan around them. Try to help us understand better, is this something that might be commercializable? Not every idea will be. Uh, and, and so from our perspective, we get the benefit of their knowledge and their expertise and their energy, and they get the benefit of trying to see how we do what we do. And are there certain fields or certain, um, I guess, majors that you're looking for when you're working with these students? Not really. Okay. And in fact, if you look at, for example, my department, we have people who are pure, if you will, business backgrounds, mm -hmm. and we have people who came up through the scientific ranks. Okay. So we could have someone who has a graduate degree in science, and we teach them all about business, and we have people who come in with a great business knowledge, and we teach them everything we can about medicine. And it's just a great mix of people. Same thing for the students. We're not looking for any one particular area. We just want people who are interested, who want to learn, and want to be part of this process. Do, do they come up with ideas beyond our research paper? I mean, do the students come up with an idea that actually makes it to market with a Mayo brand on it? Quite potentially. Now, the students, we're not asking them necessarily to come up with the idea per se. They're starting with an idea that's already been brought to them mm -hmm. for analysis, but they absolutely add to it. There's no question. And some of those ideas actually do make it to the market. And can you talk a little bit about that analysis process and how it, it sort of comes, how students determine if this is a viable medical concept? What does that look sure. like? Sure. So, so what we have to look at, it, it's, it's really challenging. It's challenging for... Um, for everybody when you're in this type of business. You have to look at a lot, you gotta kiss a lot of frogs before you find your prints. And, and so the bottom line is you're looking at ideas that on their face may, may be very um, interesting and high potential. But for example, they may not have any data behind them yet. So we're trying to figure out, is it something that is protectable? Is it something we could put a patent around to protect it so that someone would want to invest money in it? Because if I can't protect it, then an investor may say, well, anybody can do this, so why would I put my money in it, as an example. Then we're looking at what the market is, what the solution is that might help the market. And for us, the market is healthcare. It's how does it help patients? How does it help the system? How does it help our medical providers? So if the idea, let's say it's a new um, cardiac device, then we're looking at what the market is, what the existing solutions are there. But then in healthcare, it's even more complicated because then you have to look at what's the regulatory approval pathway. And that could be very long and very expensive, or sometimes it could be relatively short and easy. And then you also have to look at what, what type of reimbursement would that device get if it's successful. And because um, reimbursement rates are set, for example, by the government in certain circumstances, that will dictate what kind of market in return an investor or anybody else could get a company for the resources they have to put in to make this thing a reality. So that's the type of analysis, mm -hmm. and that's what we're having them work on, is really try to understand that entire business picture so that people aren't looking at just one factor and say, hey, this is a great idea, this is a wonderful potential solution, and not realize that from a regulatory standpoint or a reimbursement standpoint, or for some other reason, it actually won't be able to get effectively to market. I, I remember back being an intern in journalism school, and I got the distinct impression that, you know, I was taking more time of them. If they just did the work themselves, <laughs> they'd have saved a lot of time instead of working with this college person. But these must be pretty sharp kids. It's not really an internship, but uh, it, explain that relationship. It, it's not really an internship. It truly is. Uh, they're taking it for, for credit. They're going. Um, this, this, we expect a lot. We have a high bar we set for them. And certainly they're learning, there, there's no question. They're not as experienced as some of our more experienced people. But they bring a lot to the table for us. And in part what we're hoping is that some of these folks are folks that are really encouraged by what they see here in southern Minnesota and want to actually come and work and, and contribute here. They, they're going to have, we're really getting in a lot of ways the best of the best out of these private colleges and universities in Minnesota to come down and do this program. And our hope is, some of them will want to stay here and want to work in, you know, work in Rochester, work in Austin, work, work across southern Minnesota. And so you mentioned the private colleges and universities. Um, can you talk a little bit about that partnership? And, and also, are there any public universities that are involved in? Currently, it's, it's private uh, mm -hmm. colleges and universities. And um, an individual named John Meslow, uh, who is a retired Medtronic executive, really came up with the concept mm -hmm. and the idea. Um, but I think we're on our 11th year now. And so he's been working with um, th those, um, that group, and they all contribute students and teams. And the, and the fun part about it is it's, 
you don't get the sense like there's a rivalry here. It's mm -hmm. not about, you know, does the, the, does the St. Thomas crew do better than the Gustavus crew? It's more about how can they all network together, which I think is a great opportunity because you can, I, I can't think of any other forum where that, where students from all those different universities and colleges have an ability to talk together. Um, and then the universities are involved. There's a grad student for each team. So you got undergraduate students and a grad student with each team. It really is, um, for us, it's a, it's a nice model. It seems to be working very, very well. And in these 11 years, I mean, what, are, what outcome have you been most proud of? We, it, it's hard to pick any one particular sure. idea. I, it's all you know. protected by copy, in, intellectual property. That's right. He can't That's say right. We'll use that, the trade secret right. uh, uh, answer. No, really, when it's all said and done, there's, there's a lot of different ideas that have made it to market. And these ideas, what I like about them is it's not any one model. So it could be that we may end up licensing an idea to an existing company. And in exchange, there's a royalty stream that comes back mm -hmm. to mail that's reinvested into mail. It could be that we start a company around the idea, so it's a brand new company. And we've had a lot of success with Discovery Square and everything else around here. We've had the opportunity now to start a lot of companies and have a lot of success. Mm -hmm. So those types of ideas are growing on each other. We're very, we're very encouraged with the tra trajectory right now. That's Jim great. Rogers, thanks thank very much. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. And uh, thank you for joining us. Now, our town's going to be on break for a few weeks. We hope you enjoy KSMQ's special seasonal presentations during the holiday season, including the Rochester Symphony's holiday performance. Uh, then we're going to have our annual Choral Arts Ensemble Christmas at Assisi presentation, which is a, KS a KSMQ exclusive. Until next time, wishing you a joyous holiday season from all of us here at Our Town and KSMQ Public Television.